So, um, I, again, I thank everybody for coming into the space. Um, White Fragility, of course, is what we've been reading. Thank you for those who went and got the book on your own um, to be a part of um, the discussion. Today, we are supposed to look at the first three chapters. Um, and I'll say this too. Um, I will, of course, by the time we get to the third discussion, I will no longer be here. Um, even technically the second one, I'm already like not really here, but I'll probably just chime in for it. Um, but I'm just going to trust that folks will do um, an amazing job of continuing the conversation, whether I'm here or not about that. All right. So um, I just, before I get into like kind of questions, what were people's initial thoughts or reactions? Let's start there. I think that the definitions were so different than what you hear everywhere and that um, what I grew up with. It was, it was eye-opening and it was actually very refreshing to see the definition of racism and see the history of it. And um, it explains a lot of how we got where we are without anybody really minding the store about it, um, except for a lot of people who are hand raising going, ah, oh, this is a problem, this is a problem, everybody else going, well, I don't do all sorts of horrible things, so then they put it out of their mind. And this explained all of that so well. She did such a good job of saying, it, it's a systemic problem because it's the way everything is set up and here's why it's the way everything's set up. And you're going, ooh, yeah, that's a problem. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Anybody else? Initial thoughts or reactions? I thought it was quite interesting um, the way she talked about how white people are see themselves as outside of any race and that we are race innocent. I think that's the term she used and that um, race only applies to other people and not to us. And that was just a very interesting, I had never thought about that before. Um, and I, that's very interesting. It made me think a lot about that. Okay. I thought her, I thought that her explanation of individualism was pretty neat. And I also, one of the things that struck me was that the, the the idea that we have to kind of understand, we have to look back to the like racism as a whole in the broad picture instead of just looking at it. I think a lot of people's first inclination is to look at themselves and see how where they fit in, as opposed to looking at you know racial divides and and the group behavior and and their effects on on people. So that was something that stood out to me uh, early on as, as I read that that. I think we all, all, a lot of people often do. I don't want to say all, but everyone immediately says like, well, how do I contribute? And doesn't think that they contribute in any way because they feel that it doesn't pertain to them. And then on the flip side, you have others who are very quick to, instead of acknowledging racism, look for a way to show how they are discriminated against as well. And that kind of feeds into the problem. Cool. Thank you. Um, I would, if we can um, go ahead and kind of think about questions and the discussion. Um, it's funny that Kelly brought up about, um, you know, kind of this, or, or a lot of Robin's uh, work around how we think about ourselves as racial beings. And I think everybody in here, because you all look like repeat offenders to me, um, have been with me several times. <laughs> and, um, and the identity circles um, activity that I have had people do in various workshops. If you've been in one of my workshops, everybody does the um, identity circles. And I'm always surprised. Um, well, yeah, I guess I still continue to be surprised. I'm surprised that when I ask people to do that, um, that I don't give normally explicit directions. Like I don't say, oh, identity circles. I want you to list your race, your gender, your, like I never say that. I always just say, 
tell me who you are. How do you identify? And I've had people say like, well, what do you mean? Like, what do you want me to say? I'm like, nope, tell me who you are. How do you identify? And I always leave it generic because I want to see what comes up for people on their own, not when prompted, right? And one of the things I started realizing when I started doing this work here um, and continue to see, which is what I was saying surprises me, how many white people have a tendency to never put their race on the identity circles, right? So it's the, I, I, I will get gender, I'll get um, sexual orientation, um, I see like parents or I see a lot of things that would fall under like characteristics or personality, but overwhelmingly the white people who do this don't put race. Um, and if someone is led to put anything um, in that category, it would slide over into ethnicity, where it's, oh, I'm Irish, um, I'm Italian, um, you know, I have a German background or something like that. Um, whereas the people of color in the space, um, when I go around, it's one of the reasons I, I walk around and eavesdrop, as I say, when you all are writing, is because I'm, I'm really interested to see as kind of the researcher in me, um, where I want to see like what's kind of the first thing that people start to write down. and. I mean, I can say this anecdotally at this point, people of color, it's normally the first thing that we write down. It's normally the first, second thing that we write down is our race. Um, and so I kind of wanted to start with that. Um, and why is it that, you know, white people um, have a tendency to be very uncomfortable with um, or don't think about um, identifying as a racial being. And Robin talks about this in the book, but I wanna see what your thoughts are. Um, if I can speak again, um, that I grew up in a suburban, mostly white, well, I guess my neighborhood, yeah, mostly white neighborhood, um, majority white high school. Um, but now I live in a majority um, black and brown city in neighborhood and um now i think about my race much more and even before george floyd and you know the, what happened this summer um when i moved to this neighborhood it's then like oh well i'm the white person and because i'm i'm different than the people around me and that may be one reason it's just something I've noticed. And then when I take public transportation, I've noticed, you know, when I take the train, then there are mostly white people on the train. And then when I switch to the bus, there's probably mostly black and brown people. And I don't mean that it's all one or the other, but since I take multiple forms of public transportation, it's very interesting to see the differences. The subway is more mixed. If I, if I could jump in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that um, identity is, uh, she makes this point in the book, um, you know, is partially constructed by uh, comparison, you know? And so uh, various things that, um, you know, you would, might not ordinarily think about yourself is going to be thrown into relief if you're in a context that then shows the difference. So I will often tell my students that, you know, uh, in the classroom, I feel old, you know? Or when I travel abroad, I feel very particularly American. Um, and so, you know, given that, um, it, Kelly illustrated it beautifully. Um, CHC is still a predominantly white uh, context. So it's easy for white people to slip into not feeling their differences if they're doing your exercise uh, at, on campus, which they are. Hi, Julianne, it's April. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks for joining, April. Sure, thank you. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up because naturally, as you shared, I think as women, and especially as I identify as a black woman, the first thing I do when I enter a space is I'm looking for a familiar face, naturally. Um, and I also think, you know, our students do that as well. One of the things 
which is interesting for me um, as I'm teaching this fall one class professional practices is I have a class of seven students and there's one white male in the course. And my, just as I'm looking to step in a room to see, you know, are there other familiar faces whenever I'm doing anything, I'm also wondering for him, how is he feeling being in a room of six, five black women and one black male and him being the only white person in the classroom. So not only am I conscious of it, I'm also wondering, okay, how is he doing? How was that to log online, turn on your camera and see everyone in the classroom looks absolutely different from you. So it's just something naturally I think we do as women of color, people of color, um, but I also wonder how, he, how he's adjusting and how he feels being in the classroom, which tends to be the case quite often in our accelerated program. We know our population is heavily populated with black women. Um, so I always wonder how my other students are doing as well. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I think that's what Jackie was getting at, right? When you're, when you're all of a sudden the minority or you're the other, whatever other means, um, that that focus becomes very different um, for you. I know one of our cabinet members who is not able to be on right now, um, BJ talks about this all the time, um, that during the time he lived in New Zealand um, and how you know, different um, he felt and how aware of it he was and, um, you know, his whole concept of and construct for other is really came from that lived experience. Um, and that, you know, when he came back to the States, how he felt, and he's talked about this before in other sessions or with me privately. Um, so I think it's okay for me to talk about it, but um, how he said like that information, in many ways for him was his opener, his eye opener, I guess, to who he is and I, even identity formation once he realized he had this very different experience of living in another country and then coming here, um, coming back here. Um, so yeah, I think that that has um, a lot to do with it. One of the, the things that she talks about, I believe it's on page nine. Um, so it's right early on in chapter one. Um, it's a and I'll read it from here. Oh, if I can get to the right space. She says, um, yet our simplistic definition of racism as intentional acts of racial discrimination committed by immoral individuals engenders a confidence that we are not part of the problem and that our learning is thus complete. The claims we offer up as evidence are implausible. And so this is where she, you know, goes into this thing about, well, I was taught to treat everyone the same, or people don't need to be able, um, people just need to be taught to respect each other. So, um, you know, her getting at this point that we start to dismiss um, the concept because we want to focus on more blanket, um, generic things instead of talking about the hardcore reality of racism and how it does live um, in our institutions um, and not about, and I've said this before in my training, it's normally not about what happens one person to another, um, but it's of course in our systems and if it's in the systems, then what role do we have to play in trying to eliminate it, if that makes sense. So I grew up, uh, in Roxborough, uh, it's a was actually a mixed um, section of Philadelphia. Um, I played with white and black children. Um, in fact, my first kiss was from a black young boy. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Stanley Clark. He's a very he's a famous jazz musician. Um, he was one of the guys I played with. He lived around the corner from me. Um, and then my first, oh, I went to Hallahan High School and that was very diverse. My, my elementary school was all white. Um, and then I, I, my first job was at a very small company in Germantown. And I was one of four white people that worked there. And the way I'd say there was maybe 50 and the, the uh, rest of them were black and brown. And then um, a few years ago, I lived in Mount Airy and I was the only white person 
in the neighborhood. So I always, I think to myself, you know, like things that she says in here, I'm like, oh, I'm colorblind or I um, don't see color. I just, you know, think of people as they are. And I certainly want to think that of myself. Um, but I know that there's a lot of other things to do. It's not just the color of your skin, but it's the culture that you're in. Like I go to a friend's party every year and um, I'm usually the only white person there. And, uh, you know, they, the people, when I hear them talk, the black people that are there, when I hear them talking, I kind of feel like I don't know what, sometimes I feel like they're talking a different language and they are basically. Um, so this book, reading just these first three chapters has really been an eye opener for me because I haven't, I guess I've only been on the surface of things I, I, and I really do want to get into the depth of what racism is. Thanks, Mary. Why is it that folks are uncomfortable talking about race? And, and when I say folks, I'm going to have to be specific here and say white folks, because people of color, we're used to it. It's our lived experience. We talk about it all the time. Um, and I think whether, you know, um, in our homes, with friends, um, because our experience, it has been um, a lot of oppression, discrimination, marginalization, minoritization, whatever you want to call it, all these nice big terms we have today. Um, it's just, I, I, I can't think of a time when I didn't talk about race and I didn't talk about race and racism um, very freely. And so I guess for my white counterparts, why, according to Robin, why is this so uncomfortable? Or for you, why is it uncomfortable? And if it's not, talk about why it's not. Like, why are you comfortable with it? So I, I will say that maybe the answer to why it's uncomfortable for white people to talk about it um, could stem from the fact that they might not talk about it much growing up or they, they're not in those conversations. And I, I believe maybe now in, in today's time, people don't want to talk about it because they're afraid they're going to offend someone because they're not really sure what's acceptable to say, what's not acceptable to say. Is it okay to say blacks? Is it where you're supposed to say a black person? And, mm -hmm. and you can, you can not, I, I'm not uncomfortable talking about it, but I certainly don't feel that I have it all figured out either. So um, that's just me personally, but I kind of understand what, why white people feel that way sometimes as well, because I feel like I, I read a lot, just like Mary, I read a lot of these words saying, you know, things that, like, that Mary was just talking about. Like, I'm not, I don't see, love doesn't see color. I'm not, I'm colorblind. It doesn't matter what color of skin is. We've all said them. I've said it a million times. And you have to really like, ex I think you just have to kind of examine your experience and be willing to kind of, open up and be wrong sometimes or, or be, be willing to understand that like everyone has prejudice in them mm -hmm. and to say that you don't it means you're not and, and D'Angelo says this I'm not making this up but it was something I like that, that I thought that I that stuck out to me it to say that you don't have prejudice means that you're not willing to like look at yourself and say that you have prejudice or you're, you don't want to admit it so I think we may have answered the question with the statement that you were talking about earlier, Juliana, that, you know, with you and your family and your friends, you talk about it all the time because it was affecting you all, all the time. Mm -hmm. And as a white race, it wasn't affecting us. And if we were talking about it, it was among white people and we didn't have to worry about what we were going to say. And so now times have gotten to a point where, you know, I hear a lot of my white friends, well, you, you can't even say anything because you're afraid you're going to say something wrong. Well, I mean, then say something wrong and find out you said it wrong and understand that you, that, that was wrong and how you can change that the next time. So, but I, but I felt it too, talk, you know, talking sometimes and, and I find myself getting ready to say a black person. And then I'm like in my head before I even say like, wait, am I allowed to say that? And, and that's kind of our own, <laughs> we've, we've yeah. kind of built that. So that's my take on it. That's cool. Jesse, so I'm going to push you. Can I push you? Sure. 
Yeah, you know, because you're my buddy. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> so because of your the nature of your discipline, right? Sports coach, player, former player, um, and you know, being in a space where um, I mean, race is huge, right? Race is huge in sports. Um, talk to me about like how, or, or maybe give, give an example, um, maybe a story of when race for you, like on the court or in your field became like very real. Like when did you as a white guy, like really have to deal with like race, um, in the context of like sports and, and being a coach or being a player? Great question. Um, I would say the first time that it really <clears throat> stood out to me, and, I, and I'm just thinking off the question you asked me right now, but when I was in high school, I went to LaSalle High School and got cut from those teams, so transferred to Abington Friends School, which is a Quaker school in Jenkintown, in my junior year. Um, LaSalle High School probably had maybe had 10 or 15 black, kid, black boys at the time. Abington Friends was very diverse. However, mostly all of the black, the, the black men, boys, at the time, played basketball. We had a great basketball program. And so my friends and the ones that I identified with most, which were the, the, the kids on my team that I, that I was good friends with, they weren't um, full pay Abington Friends kids, nor was I. And we were they were, I, I, sh I shouldn't put myself in with, the, with, the, with their experience, but mo everyone knew that the kids that were on the basketball team didn't pay the full tuition at Abington Friends. And while it was diverse, most of the boys and girls of color were either really rich or they played basketball. And at that time it was, they played basketball. And so looking back, I, re I remember, I remember, I don't remember what I really felt. I look back now and, and like try to really think about what that must have felt like for them. Because at the time, I, I think we all just thought it was great that, that they were on our team and, and had these relationships and they were the people that we hung around with the most. And, but again, the, the, the black males were basketball players or filthy rich. So you Absolutely. were automatically stigma. They were automatically stigmatized as they're just, they're just here because they can play a sport, which isn't fair because you also needed to be really good academically to go to Abington friends. And they were all very intelligent as well or else they couldn't go there. So, but, but I'm thinking back of they, they had to have felt a certain way. They had to have felt that they didn't really belong there with their counterparts at times. I mean, they wanted to feel like they were part of it, but there's, oh, there was always going to be that question by people behind their back. Were they there because they could play sports or were they really smart enough to be at Abington France? So that's probably the first time that I encountered it thinking back. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anybody else about kind of the, uncomfortableness. I mean, Jesse talked a lot about if it's not your experience, um, then you haven't had to talk about it. I didn't know if there was a, another perspective. So, I, you know, one of the things I thought was really compelling in the book itself was, I, was the way she defines the differences between um, prejudice, discrimination, and racism. Mm -hmm. The prejudice, we're all, it's all part of the way that we think. Prejudice is, is, is just common to human thinking. That discrimination is when we actually act on our prejudice. But that racism, racism is more systematic um, and uh, systematic and, and, and also socially constructed. And so, um, so why are we uncomfortable talking about race? Well, in fact, could we be afraid to? Could we be perceiving risk? Could we be perceiving consciously, or I think as she argues, very subconsciously, that, um, that we might risk loss, we, that, that the perception that, um, that, that we might be seen as racist when we engage in these conversations. 
might introduce risk to us personally. Um, and that's scary. And you know, I would say that, um, you know, I fortunately over time, um, I've had experiences where, um, you know, I have been the other in social situations, work situations, teaching situations. And so um, it takes time. It takes time to develop a sense of um, comfort and ease with those, with those situations. So I think in light of what she, she describes, yeah, I, I think there's, there, there could be, there very likely is, the sense that I'm at risk if I, if I talk about race. And I think that's a lot of the really interesting examples that you bring up, Jesse, and that others brought up. I, if I could um, jump in, I, I, thanks, Chris, because I think um, that's a really um, good insight. I think there's also shame. I mean, I knew as a very young girl that, that I perceived um, unfairness. Um, I was a young girl during uh, the early 60s. So, <laughs> you know, the civil rights movement was right on TV and I, I saw discrimination, you know, in play and it didn't make any sense to me. And my parents were supportive of that attitude of, yeah, it's not fair, you know? So I feel fortunate in having that, but you know, it's hard to open up a discussion about it, um, you know, when you know that you've been, I, I think the white privilege part, even though the label is relatively new, it's something that I've always been aware of, and you just feel like, yeah, this isn't fair. This isn't set up the right way. Struc you know, structurally, structural racism. I can control as Chris said, um, prejudices that I have and make sure I don't, you know, act on them. And by the way, my prejudices are so weird. <laughs> they have no bounder, bounding in any kind of rational thought. Um, but I know that they're, you know, make no sense. So I hope that I'm not perceived as being discriminate, discriminatory. By the way, it's not even really race race related, a lot of my prejudices. But, you know, there's no doubt about the, um, you know, institutional racism. And so, especially as a professor, I, I really feel like I have to tread so carefully in the classroom. And I teach political science, so it's right there. But I don't want to shut anybody's opinions down. It's difficult. I think also, I, I would love to hear from um, people that are younger. I wish there were more younger people um, in this meeting. Um, and I'm talking, you know, 30 or younger, because the way that many of us were acculturated were that our schools were predominantly or entirely white, as were our neighborhoods. We didn't have to think about it. And then also there were a lot of things in our generation that we just didn't talk about. You never even talked about the big C, which is cancer. I mean, we just didn't talk about things. And so race being one of them, we never learned how to. And then when you're sitting down with a friend who is a different race, which is a stupid construct now we're finding out, but someone who is a black or brown or um, from Asia or whatever, you just don't bring that up in casual conversation because this is a friend and you're talking about other things. So there has to be a way for it to come up if it's going to be a natural conversation. Otherwise, we have a specific meeting to talk about it. And um, in psychology, we know that once we start putting a spotlight on something, then we think of everything and it's about that topic and it's over the top and it's hard to get through those layers to get down to having a meaningful conversation because everything is just um, super, um, I, I can't th even think of the word I want, but it's just super in your face of those kinds of, of things. And so it's hard to have just a meaningful conversation because you just don't bring it up. That's not fair to another person. But then you probably, I don't know, I found myself 
holding back um, when I wanted to address something. One of my baristas, one of my favorite baristas um, at the Greenville Starbucks, I just asked about him yesterday when I saw one of my other favorite baristas. I asked Chad, I said, do you know where James is? Because James and I got pretty tight. Um, James is, I don't think he's 30 yet. Um, African-American, had some really bad things in his past um, that just happened to family members. He was going pro with tennis, but we just loved talking, you know, to each other. But a white person doesn't bring that up in a conversation for many reasons. And in some ways it's too bad. Um, I would hope that younger people have more friends and have had more opportunities to be in um, schools and neighborhoods, et cetera, where they have an opportunity to make friends of many different types of people and that they can talk a lot more honestly than my generation. So I think partly it's that, that it's uncomfortable because we just didn't talk about anything. So um, kind of moving into, we were kind of, we've been in chapter one, kind of moving into chapter two where she starts to talk about racism and, and white supremacy. Um, and even just thinking, going off of what you said, Sarah. Um, so, you know, if there's been, and we can definitely look at it based on generations, right? Um, older generations, it, I, I think, within the white race really did not have conversations about um, race and, and racism. And, and I think people of color, we've kind of always talked about it, even generationally, um, and definitely among ourselves. But then the younger generations, yes, um, you know, Gen Z, which is um, everybody up to the age of, what, 20 now, um, is the most racially diverse generation of our time. And so their experiences are quite different, of course, than um, the rest of us. Um, but even with what you said, so like, how, how, how do you talk about race now? So like maybe, yeah. So Sarah, you didn't grow up having a lot of conversations. Um, that probably wasn't a lot of your story, but given our current state of affairs, and I'm, I'm gonna say even beyond even just kind of this summer, because things have been kind of bubbling for probably three or four years. Um, do people find that while you maybe didn't talk about race before, that racial conversations are happening now? And if so, are they happening um, like within the context of your family, friends, or is it across racial lines um, of maybe in the workplace or with other friend groups? What does that look like or what has it been looking like? I guess I'm trying to figure out if these conversations have started to come up more and what does that mean, especially if you didn't have a context for it before? I think that it is starting to come up more. Um, if you just simply are watching the evening news and you're watching it with somebody, or if you're sitting at, for me it's coffee, um, you're sitting at coffee with somebody and maybe other people join in, then you're talking about what happened on the news. So I, there are much, many more ways for it to occur. Um, but then again, there is that problem, and I'll just speak for myself, but I think it probably is a white problem, and that's what Robin said in the book, is we don't know how, and so then we shy away from it. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, and we don't want to look bad. We don't want to say the wrong thing, and it's really unfair to, maybe let's just pretend that there's a group of three people, and one of them is black and two are white. It's really unfair. Let's say, Juliana, you were the other person there. It's my friend Rachel and I and you. And it's unfair to look at you and say, so, and make you the spokesperson for your whole race. It would be like, it was like me at Pier 1 for a while where I felt like I had to be the sp spokesperson for everybody over 60. And that's a really bad comparison, but it's all I've got. And going, well, that doesn't seem very nice. And Juliana's my friend and I don't want to hurt her feeling and I don't want to look stupid. And so it's, it's hard to know what to do. Gotcha. But I think the conversations are starting more. And even if we look stupid and hurt somebody's feelings, we can apologize. Okay. So maybe that's what we do. 
we're, we're definitely having conversations in my home about race that I don't ever recall us having before. Um, you know, and the, the structure of that household is, um, you know, myself, my wife, and two daughters, 21 and 17. And um, I, I just don't recall talking about race in our home before the events of the summer. And um, multiple conversations, serious conversations, um, self-reflective, um, exploring a sense of responsibility, um, but in, in, in very specific ways frequently that we've never happened in our home before. Part of that might be obviously the um, developing consciousness and maturity of our daughters, but I think, you know, even a year ago, we weren't having this conversation. So it, it has definitely changed what we talk about in our house. So can I push you a little bit, Chris? Sure. <laughs> so now that you're having the conversations and with all that's coming up, the self-reflection, the learning, challenging, the uncomfortableness, do you now maybe feel that you missed out or regret maybe not doing this before? I'm just curious. Yeah, I would certainly, yeah, I would certainly say in, in, in one respect, which is, you know, sort of appreciating the fact that, you know, our, our life is, is, is kind of very much rooted in a lot of the social structures that we need to rethink. Um, so much of, you know, I, to use a term from the, from the book, we, we are wondering now, how much have we been living our life on the backstage? Um, and so I think that, um, that's really raised that level of consciousness in our, in our, in our home and um, really caused us to have, I think individually and together, some really um, pretty serious conversations about, about that. And I just, when I read the construct that she introduced about the backstage, that's what, we, mm -hmm. that's what we've been concerned about. Gotcha. Thank you. Was it Elaine that I thought was gonna jump in? Was it you, Elaine? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Um, so here's one of the questions. Um, this is a lot. It's a little heavy, but I think we can do it. Um, how does our school, CHC, reinforce a racist ideology? If we, if based on what Robin is saying, based on even what I've taught, that racism is institutional, it's in our structures, it's in our systems. How then does our own institution reinforce racist ideology? And, uh, I think one of the things is, we already touched on it a little bit, is just not having a conversation, not speaking to what's going on. I totally remember after the um, George Floyd situation, killing, all of the above, whatever you want to call it. Um, I remember coming back online after that and coming into a meeting, and we hadn't started the meeting yet, but, you know, people were logging on, and I remember hearing two gentlemen on the call uh, having conversations about how they're frustrated that sports are not on television, you know, the frustration behind sports and the pandemic, um, and feeling the heaviness, just all that, continue to feel heaviness, but just specifically that day. Um, and then going into another meeting in business as usual, the next meeting business as usual. And then thankfully, I'm grateful to be a part of the Urban League of Philadelphia. I'm sitting in on a cohort right now because we jumped in on a call um, in the entire call. There's about 22 of us in this cohort. Um, and the only conversation was about George Floyd and how we were feeling. And then feeling like I had a place to vent and, you know, share my feelings and then jumping back into the next meeting at Chestnut Hill College, business as usual. Now, of course, there were some other great things that came about in conversations we were having maybe with our, our colleagues personally, but I think the biggest challenge is there's still not conversations happening, which makes us stay where we are sometimes. Thank you. That means we have work to do. I think Jesse and Kelly were trying to jump in. I was. Kelly, do you want to go first or do you want me to go? She, she, she yielded to you, Jesse. Okay, cool. Um, I, I think that one of the ways that, that we need to 
um, do better. I, I think we need to, and, and I think it has to do with hiring practices that um, when, when I was a coach and co had been coaching for 13 or 14 years and a situation had come up, I had talked to a, a black player of my team and asked him if he thought Chestnut Hill was racist. And his response was, not really, but there aren't any, there's, there's literally no men of color for me to talk to or for any of me or my teammates or black men at this school to speak to. And it was at that point that I realized that, man, I mean, obviously you can look in a staff development and notice that, there, that we're very white. Um, but I didn't really, I don't think I, I can admit this now. I don't think I noticed that until he brought it to my attention, which is a sublim or a subconscious, sorry, somebody's trying, which is like a subconscious, you know, I guess denial of the fact that we are not, we're not set up to support everyone. We're set up to support and intentional or non-intentional, but it is what it is. And, and that's where I think that's where I think as an institution we need to do better for one. Thanks, Jess. Kelly. Uh, from a, the perspective of a professor looking at our students coming in, um, that I struggle with how how do I how do I treat students equitably, knowing that these students come from very different backgrounds and, um, and come from a racist um, educational system of which we are part? And what, and so I see that we don't, at least I don't see a place where we really, what am I trying to say? Where we really work at bringing students from where they, they actually are, where they come in to where we want them to be and, and knowing that everybody is not going to be at the same spot and I mean, you know, this is, uh, you know, I, I teach science, so um, I struggle with with the um, underprivileged students or the, just the students who haven't had the science background. And um, we have lots of programs in place to help students, but I don't think that any of them, well, Titchener Greer is slightly different, but other than that, we don't have programs to specifically help students um, integrate into higher education the way it is now. And um, as Jesse said, that we have very few, I mean, in the same vein, we have very few um, professors of color. Um, so, the only thing that I've been able to do so far um, this summer, since I've really started thinking about this, is to acknowledge my privilege at the beginning when I have a new class and, um, you know, acknowledge that I know I have privilege and acknowledge that I know also that I don't know all of the privilege I have and um, invite students to let me know if they see something that they would like to talk to me about. But there just isn't any way to, I don't see things where we're trying to bring our students, we're trying to include them in terms of the classroom. I don't know if that makes sense. Um. I'm going to bring up something that is not going to be popular with my boss, but uh, our salary structure is low. 
and talented um, faculty of color have many more options than Chestnut Hill College. We have to hope that they'll be attracted to teach in terms of faculty now I'm talking about uh, for reasons other than salary. So that's a problem. Well, it's one that Chris and I have talked about since Chris and I got here. <laughs> so um, it's, it's definitely a problem. Um, and I mean, in, in many ways, it's a problem beyond just faculty, it's the staff as well. Um, and, you know, something that um, has definitely, there's been a lot of discussion around, um, even I, I would say more than discussion, I would say a plan. Uh, I know when Chris and I started talking early on, um, there was a, a plan, things that could be done, thinking outside of the box, maybe in terms of ways to attract um, more faculty of color, um, even staff, especially in the administrative roles um, of color as well. Um, because yes, the reality is, and I, I think I put it very bluntly to Chris and to Sister Carol at one time when I said to them, black and brown people with PhDs can write our own ticket. And we know it. We know. Um, we know we can go and interview at five places. And it's all about, you know, I mean, if we want it to be about the money, it will go to the highest salary. Um, and that you can use it to drive the money up um, because it's, you know, while there are more of us um, with the terminal degrees, um, we're still not in the same representation, of course, as our white counterparts. And so um, it's still not as many of us. Um, and therefore, when we interview for jobs, um, yeah, we sit in a different position in terms of, um, you know, being given, I guess, the, the opportunity if people are really looking for that, right? Because also it can work in the reverse. And I've been in this seat a many a times. I am the diversity candidate. I meet all of and exceed most of the requirements for any position. Um, and I am the person people love to bring in to interview for a job because I have the experience, I have the education, the background, you name it, I got it. Um, but then I don't get the position and I don't get the position again and I don't get the position again and I don't get the position again. Um, this was about, what year was this? This had to be, I was doing a search between the years of 2000, seven to 2010, three years. I, um, during this search process, applied to 17 positions. 11 of them I made finalists for. That's unheard of. Only got one offer. And by the third denial, I was like, what the heck is going on? Because that, that hadn't been my story. Normally, if I interview for a position and made finalists, I got the, the offer. And I called my mentor, and she said, oh, you're the diversity candidate. I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, you're the diversity candidate. And then all of a sudden, I was like mad at myself because I do this for a living, right? I teach about diversity stuff and did not see it in my own experience that that's exactly what had happened. I checked every box. Um, but I wasn't ever going to be the candidate chosen. When I looked back at the institutions where I was denied, I would have been the first person of color ever to serve at the senior administrative level. Um, they didn't have, you know, great diversity. They, I, I wasn't going to be chosen, but I need it. I was needed in that, on that short list to be able to say, yep, see, we brought somebody in. Yep. We, we had, we, we, we did that. We, we hit our diversity target. We made it. Um, and, uh, but I was in it and didn't even see it for myself. So those things do happen. Um, I think that we have, we're making progress there, um, progress that I'm personally very proud of. Um, but I think based on what you all said, we've got work to do. So genuine conversations and not just because it's an actual program coming out of this office excuse me, coming out of this office, 
um, representation, I think at all, at all levels, especially we're doing so well with students, but in other areas we don't match. Also, what I heard you say was this equitable treatment um, piece, and then of course the salary piece. And so thank you for sharing that. Um, we only got a few more minutes um, in this chapter three, racism after the civil rights movement. A couple of you have kind of referred to the civil rights um, movement and, and you know either growing up in it or growing up shortly thereafter. And so one of the questions that I wanted to pose um, was, you know, we often hear a lot about racism in the civil rights movement, whether that was the end or it was just the, the shift of it. Um, but then we have everything that's going on now. And when I talk to Black people who um, are old enough to remember and lived, like literally lived through the civil rights movement, not even as children, but so these are much older Black folk. Um, they're saying that today feels very different. And so I guess that kind of, if we had a final question to, to discuss is, um, for those of us who are somewhat connected to civil rights movement, um, whether you even were a child during that time or if you were old enough to have lived in it, and then when you think about what's going on today, our current state of affairs, are the two different? And if so, for you, how? Julie, I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? So um, if you had any reference to the civil rights movement, whether you lived in it as a child, even if afterwards the things that maybe we heard from our parents, and then the current state of affairs as we talk about like racism, is there a difference between like kind of that era and what's going on now? And if so, kind of how do you, what is the difference or how do you see it? Juliana? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, who's that? Oh, go ahead, Lauren. No, somebody else was speaking. I, I was going to, but Lauren, go ahead, because I've been talking. Um, I, I would just say that I think the difference that, you know, this is kind of, um, I think that the difference um, here is, you know, believe it or not, for all the negative things that the internet does, one of the positive things that it has achieved is that um, students, children, the younger generation, they made friends with people who were cloaked in the anonymity of the internet. I mean, they didn't necessarily know the ethnic and the racial and the cultural background of the people that they were playing video games with. And I think on some level, this generation has achieved a perspective of friendship these are my friends, you know, they're not looking at it through the lens of differences, they're looking at it through the lens of similarities. And so in that, their ability to emerge as empathetic individuals and actually to take action on behalf of their friends, I think is more um, pronounced and maybe stronger now than it was earlier. Because I think earlier, differences were noticed before maybe friendships or familiarities or relationships were developed. And I think that this generation has flipped the script and they develop a relationship and then they identify who they're friends with. And I just think that that might be part of why the energy is so different in this environment. I'm, I, I don't have any reason to believe that. I'm just thinking that might be part of it. So I like, do, do we have a chance, um, and it, this can be for Lauren or anyone, but just a follow-up to that. Um, I think there might have been a thought that in some ways civil, the civil rights movement, um, it, it didn't bring it into racism, but it, it highlighted it um, and there was a lot of progress made. Do we think that our current uh, racial um, agenda has a stronger chance to end racism or are we maybe going to do the same thing as the civil rights movement? We'll pivot for a while and things will then probably just go back. What disturbs me about today 
is um, having, having seen Vietnam on the TV and everybody is appalled and then started um, demonstrating. They saw um, what happened with the civil rights marches on TV and had no idea some of those things were happening and were appalled and something happened. And I, I've been recently thinking of that iconic picture of, I think she was a hippie, somebody who remembers this or remembers what I'm talking about. And she stuck the flower in the barrel of that, um, mm. you know, military, whoever it was, police or whoever it was, in the end of his rifle. But we have, along with what Lauren's talking about, which is very positive and may give us a chance, we have something that is so horrible that um, it's just kind of this overrunning by police and militia and government and that you were going, didn't we learn anything from the 60s and 70s that I don't know, I really hope that what Lauren's talking about is a good counterbalance to that, but it makes me extremely worried that we still have such militant right wing, and I'm sorry, right wing to, you know, talk about you like that, but um, narrow minded um, attitudes that it's me, me, me. And so somebody makes a friend, they say, I will go out and march for my friend. I hope that's enough. And that's what's different to me. Anybody else final thoughts? Yeah, I think that um, I'm a hopeful person. <laughs> so perhaps that's, uh, you know, invading my thinking. But, you know, on average, people are more educated. Both uh, the civil rights movement and today, the success of any change today, um, you know, depends on white allies. And I think that. Um, you know, I hope, I guess, that um, plenty of people are moved by what they're seeing on television. And you got to remember too, Sarah, that what's going to get on the news, of course, is, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of outrage. And speaking about young people again, and my own comment about shame, you know, in my family, it's the young people who, um, seem to be owning the shame and willing to talk about it and saying it's not right. That makes me very hopeful. Thank you. Um, I am cognizant of the time. We started at like uh, 2.34, it is 3.34, so we've gotten our hour in. I think this was a great start. Um, we, we did uh, talk about um, a good number of the concepts mentioned in the first three chapters. Um, and the next one is chapters four through seven. So it's four chapters, but they're, uh, in terms of page length, you're around the same. Uh, that's why I, I divided it up that way. And I believe we're on the 21st, I think, October 21st, I think is our next one. Um, but I'll send it out about a week before and then do the reminders, um, again, um, I'll technically not be here, but I'll be here. Um, to, to get us through this one. So thank you, everybody. And um, keep reading. But more importantly, keep talking. Keep talking within the context of your own family, your household, and your friends. Because um, we just we have to keep the conversation going. So thank you. <laughs>